When you focus your attention on the breath, you're focusing on something that only you can know, how you feel the breathing from inside, how you feel your awareness from inside. Because this is where the problem is, and this is where the solution can be found. The problem is that we act in unskillful ways. We let greed, aversion, and delusion take over. We look for happiness in short-term things, and often forget the long-term. The solution is that we can see the problem. We can develop qualities inside that allow us to stop acting in those ways, to the point where we don't have to suffer at all. You know that people can give us advice. People like the Buddha can show us that it is possible to put an end to suffering without his example, without his teachings. We probably wouldn't be here, sitting watching our breaths right now. We wouldn't have that possibility that the end of suffering is something that is possible. That's something that we can attain through our efforts. It's because we lack skill that we don't get there. And this is the crux of the problem. No one else can make us skillful. We have to learn how to be skillful ourselves. As John Lee points out, a teacher can give you the basic instructions on how to weave a basket, how to sew a pair of pants, how to make clay tiles. But if you're going to make good tiles, clothing that looks good, wears well, a basket that's well proportioned, that'll last long, that's going to depend on your own powers of observation. Again, you have to rely on yourself. So in that sense, the practice is something that you, you can do for yourself and only you can do for yourself. Of course, other people will benefit if you have less greed, aversion, and delusion. Then less greed, aversion, and delusion will come out in your actions to bother the, the neighborhood. So it's not like you're being selfish as you focus inside. You're taking care of what you are responsible for. As the Buddha once said, that's the sign of a wise person, knowing what you're responsible for and knowing what you're not responsible for, and focusing your efforts on where you are responsible. This is work that only you can do, and it doesn't get easier as you get older, so you want to do it now. And John Suat, the founder of our monastery, who passed away 22 years ago on this date, made a comment one time. There was a famous teacher in Thailand who had said that the essence of the Buddha's teachings was not being selfish. Now, the Thai term for not being selfish means basically not looking out after yourself. His students even made a little drawing, a Buddha image. Which said, "Don't be selfish." It was ya hin ketua, ya don't. That was the the Buddha's head. Hen would be the arms. Ka tua would be the legs. And then John swam in the comment, "This is wrong. You have to look out after yourself, but you have to do it wisely." And you need both strength of heart and strength of mind. Remember, as you're training the mind, the, the Pali term jitta covers not just the thinking faculty, but also a lot of the qualities that we would associate with heart. And unfortunately, in our culture, when you talk about someone as having a good heart, it usually means that they're kind. But from the Buddhist point of view, having a good heart requires a lot more. And it deals with a lot of strengths. When you're convinced of the truth that you are responsible for your actions and 
your actions can make a difference between whether you're going to suffer or not, whether you're going to harm other people, harm yourself or not. And you have it within your power to stop that harm. Otherwise, you're convinced in the truth of the Buddha's awakening and the message of that awakening and how it bears on your life. And it bears primarily in the standards it sets for you and your willingness to put aside your reservations and put aside your doubts. Just give it a try. That's a quality of the heart, a strength of the heart. The next strength is persistence. You stick with us. In other words, whenever anything unskillful comes up in the mind, you get rid of it. And you try to make sure that unskillful things don't take over. As for skillful qualities, if they're not there yet, you try to give rise to them. And when they are there, you try to maintain them so they grow. And that requires a strong heart. You have to be patient. You have to have endurance. You have to be determined. All those Capricorn virtues. And that's a quality of the heart. The Greeks used to say that we had three energy centers in the body, one in the head, one in the chest, one in the stomach. The head was, of course, your intellect, your stomach was your appetites, and your chest, your heart, had to do with your will. So it wasn't just being sentimental and having nice feelings about other people or being kind to other people. It meant seeing that there was something really important in life and you were willing to make sacrifices. You tried to purify your will so that you willed things that were good. And here's, this is exactly what we're doing. We're willing what's skillful, what's going to be harmless. We're willing to stop this process by which we travel around trying to create little worlds around our desires, creating identities around our desires. And our desires are pretty blind. We can learn how to want almost anything. A lot of things when you think about it are pretty disgusting, but our desires can dress them up. So we want to learn how to will to overcome those appetites. That's the quality of a good heart, a strong heart. So then you will to keep these lessons in mind, because you realize that if you learn these things and then forget them or apply them haphazardly, they don't really accomplish anything. So you've got to keep this in mind all the time. That's the strength of mindfulness. And that requires having some priorities. There are a lot of things that the world would like to have us keep in mind that have nothing to do with our true well-being or anybody else's true well-being. And so we have to realize that, no, our frame of reference has to be what we're doing right now. So we try to stay established with our sense of the body as we feel it from within. So they're fully aware of what's going on in the body. That means we're going to be fully aware of what we do with the body. The same with the mind. The same with our speech. both our inner speech and our outer speech. We have to be especially mindful of how we relate to our feelings, feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain, because those can spark some pretty unskillful desires very quickly. So we have to learn how to cultivate pleasures that are more skillful. Uh, pleasures, what the Buddha calls pleasures of the flesh. Nice sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, thoughts about these things. And then there are pleasures not of the flesh. Those are the pleasures that come from getting the mind concentrated. And those, he says, you want to develop. So we're mindful to develop them, give rise to them, and then maintain them. This is where the practice of concentration comes out of the practice of mindfulness. Again, this too is the strength of the heart. You're willing 
is to stay with one thing and not let your other desires come in and waylay what really should have top priority in your life. And you know that. So you want to be able to keep your focus strong. You're going to need this strong focus as you're alive and then as you approach death. Because think about it, if you're about to die, what's going to go through your mind? All kinds of things. Memories of what this person did to you, what that person did to you, or what you wanted to do with somebody, you didn't get to do it. Sensual cravings, cravings to take on an identity as your body is pushing you out. So your mind is going to be running off every which way if you haven't learned how to control your focus, control your your concentration. So while you're strong and well and healthy, try to develop these powers. This too is a strength of the heart. It's based on this concentration where you really get the mind still, that you can see what's going on inside. This provides the basis for discernment, and it provides a basis for a discernment that is reliable, or at least more reliable than it would be if your mind were running around. And if it's based on conviction, based on persistence, it's even more reliable. So this is where the head comes in. But even here, the head is motivated by the heart, because what is discernment based on the Buddha's way of discernment? Of course, it's the Four Noble Truths. Sometimes you hear it expressed as the three characteristics. Seeing things as being in constant stressful, not self. But those are perceptions. And those perceptions have meaning within the context of the framework provided by the Four Noble Truths, which is that you're trying to comprehend suffering and abandon its cause. So anything that would give rise to the desire to cling to things, that would be the craving and the clinging. You want to learn how to see these things through those, through the lens of those three characteristics. So you let go of the craving. Really understand what it is that's suffering. We tend to think pain is suffering. And in Pali they use the same word. But when the Buddha defines suffering as clinging to the five aggregates, it shows it's not just ordinary pain. It's something the mind is doing. Do we do this why? Because we want to put an end to suffering. And why do we want to do that? Because we have goodwill for ourselves and goodwill for all the people around us. Look at that here again, a quality of the heart. So now that the heart is more willing to listen to discernment, both sides get trained. As the sermon points out, there are a lot of things that we like that are actually suffering or are going to cause suffering. We I mean, wouldn't crave things if we didn't think we would like them. We wouldn't cling to things unless we thought that we would like them. The problem is that we're deluded. The discernment is what allows us to put an end to the delusion, and that's the head side. So your heart has to be willing to listen to your head. But your head has got to listen to your heart. And if it's going to be reliable in its calculations, it has to have a good heart, a strong heart. So we work on these strengths. And as I said, even though the most that other people can do for us is to give us advice and set examples, the work is done inside. But the results of the work don't stay inside. They spread out to other people. Think about Ajahn Sawat. He was born in a poor peasant family in northeastern Thailand. Didn't even speak Thai when he was a kid. He was in an area where they spoke Cambodian. Got a basic education, learned how to speak Thai. And looking at him from the outside, he was one out of eight children in a very poor family. There wasn't much hope for him. 
But he realized that the Buddhist teachings were not just for educated people or rich people, they're for everybody. And he saw that as an opportunity to escape from the confines of what no people would normally say about his life. And he trained himself, both in heart and in mind. He came here to the States and ended up setting up this monastery so that people of all nations, all backgrounds, would have a good place to practice. So he took care of his own internal problem and did it in such a way that we benefit as well. We benefit because he did a really good job of taking care of his own internal problem. So that sets an example for us. Our problem is inside, but the potentials for solving the problem are also inside, developing both a good mind and a good heart, developing these strengths of the heart, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. So that our wisdom, our discernment has a good grounding. The kind of grounding that keeps it honest. So it's a total training. And it deserves our total attention, our total conviction. The more we give ourselves to the practice, the more we gain. And that's called looking after yourself in a way that's wise.